I was going to do a red carpet review, but then they decided to bleach the darn thing. So here we are. Hey everyone, it's Yassel. It's lovely to see you. You know I love when you visit. I know it's been a minute. <laughs> I am currently taking a break from a much longer video that I'm working on that should be coming out soon. And I know I teased last week, but it is a lot. <laughs> like I decided to make a video that is just so involved. <laughs> <laughs> that I thought I would pause so that I could catch up a little bit with you guys and chat about the Oscars. Lest you forget that I, you know, exist. So let's go ahead and address the elephant in the room, not the Babylon one. We'll get to that later. The carpet. For the first time since 1961, the carpet color has changed. And I don't think it should have. Why did this happen? I just... How did we get here? So for this red carpet, the Oscars enlisted the aid of the Met Gala team. So Lisa Love, former Vogue editor, and the Met Gala creative director, Raul Avila. So they had this whole unrolling ceremony, which is great because at least then some of the stars and or their stylists got the heads up beforehand that the carpet color changed, just in case they had to make like a corresponding outfit change. But I wanna pull a couple of quotes from that evening that I feel highlight the why and the why now. Conveniently, both of them are in a Variety article that I will link below for you. So Love told the Associated Press, we chose this beautiful sienna saffron color that evokes the sunset because this is the sunset before the golden hour. Now that carpet is not sienna or saffron. It's very much champagne. It's a champagne. It's a white carpet. The carpet is white. Um, but I believe the saffron color is in reference to the orange tent that was erected outside as well. So normally it's like red carpet, red tent. This time they went champagne carpet, saffron tent. Sure. Now, here's the thing. This seems to be part of a, in my opinion, maybe disturbing is too strong of a word. Weird trend of changing carpet colors. Now, the New York Times points out that the carpet color changes are a trend, but in my opinion, they are comparing apples to oranges in that article because they list as examples the Emmys, which did a gold carpet, and the Golden Globes, which did a tragically gray carpet. I just, I, no, I don't get it. I'm not even gonna pretend like I understand. But they also listed it exa as examples some movie premieres, notably the purple carpet at the Wakanda Forever premiere and the blue carpet at the Avatar Way of Water premiere, which they had also done for Moana. And when I say they're comparing apples to oranges, I mean that movie premieres are going to be very different from award ceremonies. In a way, it makes way more sense to have the carpet coincide with the theme of a specific event, like a specific film. And Disney has been doing this for a while. And I have no doubt that they will roll out the blue carpet for their eventual Little Mermaid premieres also, because it just makes sense. Maleficent, the carpet had thorns on it. For Pete's Dragon, the carpet was green. It's a very Disney thing to do. And it's just like a very fun thing to do. A fun design element, a style choice that adds to the whimsy of it all, you know? And the Met Gala themselves also changes the carpet. But again, the Met Gala has a different theme every year. There's a different theme for the red carpet that coincides with the theme of the fashion exhibit that year. So for Notes on Camp, the carpet was a bright, fun pink. And for In America, it was red, white, and blue. For Heavenly Bodies, it looked like they borrowed some cathedral inspiration, etc., etc. So in that way, the Met Gala constantly changing their carpeting, that makes sense. It's, it's like the way you decorate your house for the holidays, you know, when you put up Christmas decorations or you put up, I don't know, Valentine's Day decorations or Halloween decorations. Like you just want 
you're enjoying the vibe. You're trying to tie everything together. It's just a fun way to, to do that, to tell that story. However, an awards ceremony is celebrating a wide variety of films with a wide variety of themes and you're awarding people in a variety of categories, right? Not one film, not one theme, many. So in that instance, I feel like the red carpet shouldn't change. It needs to serve as the backdrop for an ever-changing film landscape. As far as the Academy Awards are concerned, red is a neutral backdrop because it's already been established as the normal and therefore neutral. The very first red carpet was rolled out in 1922 for the premiere of Robin Hood. When the Academy debuted its red carpet in 1961, it had very quickly established itself as a very specific signature shade, Academy Red. It's an intrinsic part of the whole ceremony. So why are we changing it now? Option one, this was deliberate sabotage on the Mets part. <laughs> I say this because red has a very distinct advantage over white. I don't know if you guys know this, but um, white gets dirty very quickly, very noticeably, <laughs> which actually became a nightmare for the team at the Oscars, who apparently had to keep cutting out squares of really dirty carpet and like replaced <laughs> <laughs> with patches of fresh carpet? Ay, ay, ay. Why, why would you do that to yourselves? I hope that the lesson was learned there <laughs> because the backlash was swift, <laughs> the dirt was noticeable, and the managing of that was a nightmare. <laughs> Option two. So at this unrolling ceremony, Jimmy Kimmel made a very telling joke. He said, <clears throat> I think the decision to go with a champagne carpet rather than a red carpet shows how confident we are that no blood will be shed. And that, my friends, is the truth of it. That is the reason I think the carpet changed. I think they wanted to, like, symbolically distance themselves from the old red art carpet Oscars where people were slapped on stage. <laughs> is really it. Among other changes, they had a crisis team in place this year and they had like a specific dress code for press. They just wanted everyone that wasn't a, a guest in black or navy blue. So yeah, so old Oscars, slap. New Oscars, dirty white carpet. Great. I don't even wanna bother entertaining an option three because it's just so infuriating to think about. <laughs> But yeah, I just find it so stupid. But I'm gonna bring it up anyway, because it's gonna be a great segue into the next part of this video. <laughs> so the New York Times also discussed the carpet change and they quoted an event planner named Mindy Weiss, who I'm sure is a very nice woman, but to me is coming across as like, the most insufferable human being on the planet when I read <laughs> this quote. Like, I'm gonna get angry all over again reading it, but here we go. The color of red carpets has changed because of fashion. The color of red carpets has changed because of fashion. It has to match the dresses and the red clashed. What? It all goes back to fashion and style and trend setting. Miss Weiss said, the carpet should reflect the fashion that's going to walk down it and not fight with it. And I have some issues with this. I think this is the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Now, the other video that I'm currently working on is so, again, ridiculously involved that I literally don't have time to like sit here and unpack all of this, but I would love to continue this conversation with you guys in the comments, so please let me know your thoughts. Do you agree? Do you disagree? But the long and short of it is TikTok plus Shein equals microtrends equals the death of personal style. And I think we need to draw a line somewhere, <laughs> and I'm going to draw it at this freaking carpet, okay? <laughs> like, trends... Come and go. Academy Red is forever.
or it should be. Let me know what you think. Now, the funny thing about her complaining about the red carpet clashing with fashion is that this white carpet featured so many white dresses. <laughs> Among them were two Best Actress nominees that disappeared into it, frankly. Among all the other angels and brides on the carpet last night. Whereas, had the carpet been red, they would have stood out more. So obviously the people who showed up in colors were the standouts. And by far, the person that stood out the most was Cara Delevingne, who showed up to a white carpet in a red dress. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know why this was the trend. I can't put my finger on why. I don't know if they had been doing this and we're just noticing it more or I'm just noticing it more because of the carpet change. But the amount of white dresses was pretty wild, right? Mindy Kaling and Vera Wang. I feel conflicted. I love the color on her. Like, I think she looks great in white. I think darker skin tones look amazing in white. The fit is great. The sleeve though, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. The peplum, it like, it's a lot. It's a lot of dress. And also like, you know, whatever your Velma feelings, uh, I think white is a, is a great color for her. Um, <laughs> uh, but I have to hand it to her, you guys, because Vera Wang also made this dress in black. Now, she picked the white, or so we thought. She picked the white to walk the red carpet, sorry, the white carpet. <laughs> but then she pulled a switcheroo and changed into the black one for the ceremony, which I thought was really fun. I, I love an outfit change moment. So she did it, she did the thing. And I thought I have to appreciate that she was like, you know what, I'm gonna, I can't decide. I'm gonna wear both. I'm I'm a Gemini, so I, I feel this in my soul. Ariana Du Bois in Versace Atelier. Uh, I think it's stunning. I think she's stunning. I think there's a lot of ideas here and we could have maybe gone with one less. Like maybe the, we don't have the sleeves or maybe we don't have like the double neckline thing like you know like like we could have we could have lost one thing or or even like the extra train fabric on her it works like i feel like she pulls it off it's all working together i think for the average human being i think i'm still leaning lose one of the ideas <laughs> I'm also just a big fan of color, so it's kind of sad to see a lot of these white dresses. And then again, we had two Best Actress nominees in white. So we had Michelle Williams and Chanel Couture. I think this is stunning. I I love a cape. She looks really ethereal. I very angelic. Love the haircut. But Michelle Yeoh and Dior Couture, on the other hand, I. You know, I had to like pause. I didn't want my love of both Michelle Yeoh and my love of Dior <laughs> to blind me to the fact that the two weren't working together. <laughs> so please don't come for me. If you disagree, I, I totally respect that. But I actually was pretty underwhelmed by this. I'm sure that up close, the dress is even more amazing than what we see on the screen. Obviously it's couture, it was done by hand. Microphone issues aside at the SAG Awards that at least the Scaparelli straw situation was more interesting. So let's talk about the, the rainbow, everyone else. Jessica Chastain and Gucci. Jessica Chastain is Jessica Rabbit. <laughs> Love this custom crystal sequin Gucci gown. Love the Gucci high jewelry in green to complement her red hair. I thought this uh, looked amazing. Nicole Kidman in Armani Privé, on the other hand, uh, why? 
why the the one sleeve and the two flowers i am confusion i don't even know how i would fix this except to like add the sleeve back and take the flowers off or just take the flowers off i don't get it i don't get it i am a sucker for when an actor kind of channels their film in their wardrobe for example Carrie Condon in Versace. This is one of my most favorite looks of the night. A lot of people looked amazing, but I love this look in particular because of the color, because she's wearing this yellow that actually reminds me of the coat that she wore in Banshees of Inishirin. So it felt like a nice callback to Siobhan's coat in the film because it felt like a very deliberate choice on either her or the her stylist's part to incorporate that little bit of her character with this with this color that we associate with Siobhan in the film. Same reason I love Angela Bassett in purple. She's wearing a Jeremy Scott Moschino custom and of course she's wearing purple the color of royalty because she was the queen of Wakanda. <laughs> so we love to see it. Holly Bailey, again, gorgeous custom gown. It is, however, Dolce & Gabbana, which is rather unfortunate. Um, but again, like it's youthful. She's the Little Mermaid and we see that in the gown, right? Like she's wearing water <laughs> like this dress is it's sheer it's youthful it's giving disney princess but still really cool it's giving under the sea foam green the cohesion between the actor and the garment and their film success sandra O oh in john batista valley i love this this marigold color <laughs> i love that woman uh, she looks like a goddess. When I first saw her, I instantly thought of Demeter, like the goddess of the harvest. That's that's what I envisioned in my head. But actually, John Batista Valli was inspired by his travels to India. So it's more reminiscent of like monks robes, but she will forever be a goddess to me. I love the, like the softness of the hair. Like it's all Greek goddessy to me. Florence Pugh and Versace living her whole best life. Like <laughs> she continues to just give off this air of I'm so unbothered, <laughs> you know, post don't worry, darling, <laughs> that I, I mean, it's great. I love this look because again of how fun it is and how fun it was styled her hair like so different for the red carpet, so whimsical, so fun. I love the hot pants, they have pockets. It's it's very punk and club kid and super non-apologetic. I feel like this look could have gone very maternity were it not for the uh, addition of the hot pants underneath. So like I could have seen Rihanna wear the same look, maybe with some like latex black opera length gloves. It's another, it's another great one. So there was some Louis Vuitton present on this carpet as well. And I have some mixed feelings about it. Anna de Armas in Louis Vuitton, I hate it. Um, I feel like it just looks really heavy and like a craft project. And I know that it took literally a thousand hours of work to make, but to me, <laughs> it feels like a wasted effort. <laughs> I don't know, I just feel like the shapes look clunky. I, is it just me? Do you guys love this dress? Let me know what you think. I feel like we could have done without the whole bottom of it. <laughs> I don't know. And then we had Jennifer Connelly in Louis Vuitton as well. And same thing, like I'm not in love. I love the way she was styled with like her hair slicked back, no jewelry apart from a ring, but no earrings because of this whole Swarovski piece uh, that was part of the dress right there. But I almost think that the dress would have looked better without it. 
kudos to to her and to Louis Vuitton for doing something different. Like I definitely haven't seen anything like that before. So there's part of me that like wants to love it. Like I want to love how different it is, but I just don't right now. Maybe I need time. Cara Delevingne, again, stunning. The color, the leg. Please come back for Only Murders in the Building season three. Would love to have you. Elizabeth Olsen and Givenchy, again, giving some Wanda, right? Because of the hem, like it's kind of witchy <laughs> in this black, kind of liquid smoke. I, I think it looks great on her. Part of me feels like, so I used to go to FIT and I feel like if I were to turn in a dress like this as an assignment that the professor would get on me about the hem because I feel like there's two different hems there, maybe telling two different stories. I feel like maybe it needed like another layer as a segue between the beaded part and the, the sheer part. I don't know, like just something like a third thing to help it transition. So I think she pulls it off well. I'm just saying, if I had a nitpick, I feel like if I were to turn this dress in as an assignment that I'd get called out by my professor. Rihanna continuing to redefine pregnancy fashion and looking incredible in this Alea. What a sight, I, she's amazing, bless. I mean, she, she can do no wrong. Editing me here and I am screaming because I had originally taken all of these notes as I was watching the red car the sorry the champagne carpet live and I guess I was a little late to the game and I almost missed talking about the greatest look of the evening because she had shown up so early and that was Fan Bing Bing. Uh, it's, I mean, it's everything you could ever want in uh, a red, uh, red carpet or champagne carpet moment, right? This is a Tony Ward couture gown. It's fresh and new and different with the bright green and like the, the billowing situation. And it's giving old Hollywood glamour at the same time with the silver dress and the styling of the hair and makeup. This is exquisite. Uh, this is, to me, hands down, the, the winner. If we had to declare a red carpet winner, this, this is it. Let's give it up for the pink parade as well, because I feel like there were some misses, but definitely some some hits among them. Now then, you guys, you guys, the guys, let's hear it for the fellas. I I applaud you all, most of you. I Harry Shum Jr. in a DM for <laughs> I like how you like how I pronounce it as if I'm asking a question because I really hope I didn't butcher it. Harry Shum Jr. in a DM for the win. Like, seriously, I I actually feel like this look is so fun. I wish the collar had just like made up its mind. Like, are we a, sh a shawl or are we doing the lapels? Maybe just pick one. But I overall, I love the idea. I love the fit. I always look forward to how the men will change it up. So this was such a fun take on the suit. It's like meets like smoking jacket, meets kimono, meets like like karate uniform almost. I think it's a brilliant, it's a brilliant East meets West fusion garment, which you know was clearly the goal here. Austin Butler in Saint Laurent. I love his shoes so much. I kind of wished he'd pushed the Elvisness more. Like I wish he'd worn a fun color but i do love like the like the subtle hints still like he could put on some eyeliner or something you know like just a little just a little bit more just push it just a little more maybe worn like a bolo tie i don't know just something else the rock in a pink jacket fantastic pink satin jacket fresh cut fl flower so fun paul mezcal in the gucci suit bless daniel kwan this was phenomenal so this was a custom suit that was made to look like evelyn's punk sweater in the movie and because the suit is also like all red and he's wearing a bolo tie it reminds me of 
uh, Steven Yeun's character in Nope, which is another incredible film. So I, I feel that that was also a, a, a little bit of a deliberate choice because he could have just done the top, but he went like all red, bolo tie. Let's make a tribute to two awesome films together. Why not? Like it, it totally worked. This made me so happy. Paul Dano, yes, yes to the sparkles. Again, unfortunately, Dolce, <laughs> but pink pink shirt, sparkly, bejeweled, <laughs> like bedazzled uh, jacket. It's phenomenal. It's just another fun look. Riz Ahmed, no, I, I don't get it. This was not a successful look to me. It was unfortunate. The pink was also like furry, like it was like a mohair. And then there's like a, so it's like this pink and brown and, but then the rest of the suit is black. I almost wish this, the rest of the suit had been white. Cause then you could have gone for like a, it would have read more as like a campy Neapolitan ice cream type of thing. I think that would have made it work, but then like the chocolate brown, strawberry, almost Pepto-Bismol-y pink on the black together. It was weird. It was, it, it didn't work. But John Cho, great. Simple, great. Pedro Pascal, I mean, I, I love this on him. I, I would actually love to see him in uh, my pants. Uh, yeah, those are my, and those are my Pedro Pascal thoughts. I just, yeah, that's just, me. Barry Keoghan is, is out here just constantly having so much fun with his wardrobe. This was 99% perfection. The shoes are cringe. I wish he'd paired this with like a loafer. Uh, I think even a white sneaker, you know, would have made this. Okay, now let's talk about best costume design. I'm not going to go too in-depth on all of these, but I am going to share some thoughts. Jenny Bevan for Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris and Catherine Martin for Elvis. So Jenny Bevan, this was her 12th Oscar nomination and it would have been her fourth win. She previously won for Room with a View, Mad Max Fury Road, which I saw in the theater twice and totally would have gone to see it a third time. That movie was phenomenal and she 1000% deserved that Oscar win. But she won for Cruella last year, and I have <laughs> some feelings about that. I'm also really biased because West Side Story was also nominated, and I feel like Paul Atswell should have taken that. But I am also very biased because I was in West Side Story, <laughs> so I almost rather it had gone to Dune instead because the costumes in Dune were also phenomenal. So I'm a little disappointed that Cruella took that home because it was missing fur. That just immediately disqualified it <laughs> for me. And Catherine Martin uh, nominated for Elvis. So she previously won for Moulin Rouge and The Great Gatsby, both phenomenal films that I absolutely loved. Again, both super well-deserved. I think Catherine Martin and Baz Luhrmann are my favorite movie-making couple, <laughs> but uh, I don't know if they are any others? They might be the only one. Uh, I don't know, like, I don't know of another husband and wife team doing this, but they are, I can see why they continue to work together because it's incredibly successful. I'm not gonna get too much into detail about these movies specifically, but well, what I will say is I haven't seen Mrs. Harris Goes to Paris yet. I do want to, and as soon as it becomes available for streaming, I will, but I thought Elvis was phenomenal. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thoroughly enjoyed the costumes. The reason these two movies did not win is because a lot of the work in these films centered around recreations. Jenny Bevan recreated a lot of Dior. Catherine Martin recreated a lot of Elvis's existing wardrobe. In fact, I believe she commissioned a lot of Elvis's jumpsuits. So the company that made them originally made them for this film. It was a lot of outsourced work. And again, it's kind of hard to win best costume when a lot of your costumes are going to be pre-existing pieces that you're just copying. As great as their work is, I knew that neither one of these movies stood a chance. <laughs> they were never gonna win. Shirley Karata for Everything Everywhere All At Once. Now, if you watched my previous <laughs> Everything Everywhere All At Once video, you know that I was rooting for Shirley from the get. If it was up to me, 
I would have voted for this film. So I'm not going to get into it in this video because I already have a dedicated everywhere all at once video that I will link to. So if you haven't checked it out, please do. It is definitely a film worthy of a deep dive and I gave it to it. So please enjoy. Babylon. Babylon is a movie that makes me really angry. Now, if you had to guess what time period this movie was set in based on Margot Robbie's outfits, what would you guess? You're wrong, it's the 20s. And therein lies the problem. That is why this movie was doomed from the start. I knew this movie wasn't gonna win because it just made no sense. I struggle with Babylon because when I watched it, it honestly, strangely, didn't feel like three hours, but at the same time, it didn't need to be three hours. If anything, it was more frustrating for me because I feel like for it having been a three hour film, it still felt lacking to me in some areas. The costume design specifically. Here's the problem with that movie. So the costume designer for Babylon was Mary Zoffries, who previously worked on La La Land and was nominated for an Oscar for that film as well. There was quite a bit of work that went into this film. There were over 7,000 costumes made for this movie. Mary Zoffries herself will tell you that she did quite a bit of research into the period and into how costumes were made back then. I break the script down, I do an intense amount of research. That's reading diaries, watching every 20s film I can get my hands on, and reading all the books that Damien told me to read. But then he basically told her to forget all of that because when it came to Nellie Leroy, we don't see a 1920s character. And same thing for hair and makeup. He basically told everyone he didn't want it to look like a stereotypical 1920s film, which begs the question, why film a movie set in the 20s? <laughs> like if you, if you don't want your movie to look like a 1920s film, then why bother making a 1920s film? That is a problem. I also feel like it led to a lot of confusion on the part of us, the audience, and then confusion when it came to the people in charge of marketing and like advertising this film because they didn't know what to do. I think that because Margot Robbie didn't look a certain kind of way despite it being a certain kind of movie that took place in a certain period, the people whose job it was to promote this movie didn't know what direction to take it. And so they tried to just like sell it to like Gen Z, as look at how cool this chick is. It's written in the stars. I am a star. It's when a lot of Gen Z and millennials alike have a love of nostalgia. And so getting more of that authentic looking 1920s period imagery would have gotten us way more excited than what we got, which was like, Me, why am I always so tired? Ugh. Also me at 3 a.m. Oh! hot garbage. It was very like pulling from the 70s. But then it's like, if, if you wanted your costume designer and your hair and hairstylist and your makeup artist to pull reference from the 70s, why not just set the movie in the 70s? Why are we going for Studio 54 circa 1920 when you could have just done Studio 54. The thing is, when you work on a film, everyone has their part to play. Your director, your writer, your, your producer, your editor, your costume designer, your hair, makeup artist, etc, etc. And all of those things need to work together. Everything has to come together to tell a cohesive story. When you want to take the background in these characters, this direction, in this time period and you want to take this character in this direction and make her look like she's from this time period there's a breakdown in the cohesion and so there's a breakdown in the story the whole thing ends up being a confusing mess and it's really hard to market a confusing mess i also feel like there's this weird cognitive dissonance between damien and chazelle wanting to make a movie that celebrates a love of movies and movie making, but then at the same time 
wants to completely disregard and disrespect the aesthetics of the period that he's making the movie about. And it just made me not like the movie as much as I would have if the team behind this film had actually approached it with respect to the time period. It tells me that you don't want me to take your movie seriously. So why would you win any Oscars? Let me know what you think. I mean, there's no way for me to prove this, but I honestly believe that they, if they had actually leaned into all of the things that made the 20s, the 1920s, the eyebrows, the uh, bobbed hair, actual drop waist dresses, if that had been shown to people, more people would have gone to see the film. The way the film was marketed actually turned off a lot of the people that would have otherwise gone to see and enjoy a 1920s, 30s movie. But because they were never sold that to begin with, they didn't go see your film. So I feel like the director, costume, and makeup and hair people really shot themselves in the foot with the stylistic choices that they made. Uh, and hopefully they've all learned their lesson and won't do this again because it's dumb. Heba Thor's daughter is the film's makeup department head. And in an interview with Pop Sugar, she explained that the, the characters were wannabes. These are people who have no money and he, Chazelle, wants them to just be that. I wanna give some pushback here. Oh, by the way, she says they got the inspiration for the beauty looks in this film from looking at mug shots of the period. On the one hand, they say that they wanted these people to look like they had no money. And at the same time, they're saying that Nelly Leroy is, quote, she's young, she's free, she's wild, and she likes to party. They also make it a point to say that her backstory is she was a dancer in New York. While at the same time, trying to sell us on this idea that she's, quote, she doesn't come from money or prestige and she's not up to date on the latest trends. I'm gonna give some pushback here. I need to argue because I'm just hearing a lot of excuses I'm just seeing a lot of excuses right now because you're saying she likes to party and you're saying she was a dancer in New York. Those two things tell me that she absolutely would have known what the latest trends were. <laughs> if she's out and about partying and dancing in New York, she's going to see other women her age rocking fashionable bobs. So to say that she wouldn't have known makes no sense. To argue that she didn't know because she didn't have any money also doesn't have, also doesn't make any sense. Again, I have to give some pushback because chopping your hair off is free, okay? It would have made more sense to me if she'd rocked like a really uneven bob because in an effort to fit in, she just took a pair of scissors to her own hair standing in front of her bathroom mirror or she made her dad cut it for her or made someone else cut it off for her, you know, because she wanted to be a famous movie star and she wanted to look the part. That would have made more sense. The makeup thing is another thing that doesn't fly with me as far as not having money. Just to give you a little taste of what my next video is going to cover, spoiler alert, it's a makeup history deep dive. So feel free to subscribe and turn on that notification button so that you will be the first to know once I get that video out. So Thomas Lyle Williams founded Maybelline in 1917. He was inspired to create this mass market product after watching his sister Mabel, who just mixed coal dust and Vaseline and applied that to her eyes. So if you have some Vaseline lying around, you have like either some coal dust or some ash from having just like lit a candle, then you could have made your own makeup for no money. This was a major problem with Nelly because if the hair and makeup had been period accurate, then we, the audience, would have been able to forgive the choices that were made with the costumes because one part of the look would have sold the rest of it as being 1920s. You could say the same for the opposite. If she had worn period accurate garments, that would have sold the hair and makeup not being correct. But because none of those things was period accurate, then the whole look falls flat and you fail to convey 1920s. And then you're just relying on the background looking the part to sell your story. 
and that is just lazy. Uh, things I did like, Jean Smart's character. Uh, Jean Smart as Eleanor St. John looks phenomenal. I love her party look because I saw the headdress and I thought it was very like erte, so that was really fun to see. I loved Lee Jun Lee as Lady Fei Zhu. She's very much obviously a stand-in for anime Wong. I loved loved Brad Pitt as Jack Conrad. He's a little John Gilbert meets Douglas Fairbanks, like a little dash of Clark Gable on top. Like I, I loved that character. I There was a moment towards in the beginning of the film where he ends up in a pool and you think he's a goner. Uh, and then he just like gets up out of the pool and goes to pass out in his bed. And I felt like the gag there was that Gatsby himself ended up uh, a goner in his pool. <laughs> I thought that was like kind of a cheeky Gatsby nod as if to say, and this is where all of your Gatsby notions must end because the rest of this three hour film will have none of that. I also actually really like the singing in the rain scene. I love that all the raincoats were pink because this was actually something that was done in the era of black and white movies, you would have your actors wear pink in a lot of scenes because it's still read as white uh, when you were filming in black and white uh, and sometimes it could read as like a light gray even. For example, if you watch the old 1960s uh, Adams Family, the Adams Family house is actually pink. Like those walls were pink. So I thought that was really funny because that was like a really historically accurate detail. And what's interesting is that I found the original video. It's on YouTube because everything is on YouTube, but it's colorized. Now movies weren't in color until like the 40s and 50s. And this song was recorded in 1929. So obviously someone went back and colorized it. But when they added color to it, they made everyone paint. So I'm guessing that's what they based this scene on. And I just thought that was really funny. And I'm, I'm including a clip for you here. That great sound scene, take after take after take. In case this is your first time watching me, I am a background actor. And so I have been in situations like this where you will be on a set and something goes wrong and you have to do take after take after take after take. For example, when we were filming West Side Story, there was one guy and that's how I knew the yelling guy was the assistant director <laughs> immediately because it's the assistant director's job to do all the yelling. So I was working on West Side Story and Steven Spielberg gets to just like sit there and be quiet and like film. And then he has the other guy, the assistant director, whose job it was to like get on a megaphone and yell at all of us. And <laughs> so he was constantly having to call for retakes of the scene we were filming America because we were filming in a neighborhood, like we're, we're filming in the Heights. And so the thing about filming in a neighborhood is people live there. <laughs> so we're trying to film the sequence and people are like looking out their windows. They're trying to get in and out of their apartments. <laughs> like, I'm, I just want to go out and walk my dog. Like, so they have to like cross the set and enter the set and they're like peeking out of the windows. And every time someone would just like look out of their window to check out this movie being filmed on their block, he'd have to yell cut. I like yell at the person and then we'd have to go again. So I think that one day we only filmed maybe like five, 10 minutes of footage. <laughs> like there was this one part and that one part of that one scene where it was like 18 takes because we had to keep starting and stopping. So that having that experience and then watching that scene, I, I totally got it. But what I didn't get again is whatever the hell Margot Robbie was wearing. They based it off of an existing outfit, but again, even for the period, the hemline was way too short. Her hair was ridiculous. At this point, it should be in the hands of hair and makeup and wardrobe people that are working on that film. She should look a little more polished at this point, and we're still not seeing that, and so that was really frustrating. We also have to address the other thing that makes anarchistic fashion choices work, which is the styling. If the hair and the makeup are period accurate, you can get away 
with taking more liberties when it comes to the costume. Scarf tap pants situation probably would have been more believable if Nellie Leroy had actually been rocking a bob at the time. Okay, now that I've gotten my Babylon rage out of my system, thank you for listening to me. I would now like to move on from it to talk about our winner, Ruth E. Carter, the costume designer for Wakanda Forever who just became not only the first black woman to win an Oscar for costume design, which she actually won for the first Black Panther movie, but she actually just made history as the first black woman ever to win two Oscars. And like I said before, I was totally rooting for Shirley Carrada to take this trophy home. That being said, the, why can't I talk anymore? The, the scope of Ruth Carter's work was so much bigger and it was so much more involved that I completely understand why she won and it was totally well deserved. I'm gonna tell you right now, I am a total geek. Like I am a geek, a nerd, whatever you wanna call me. I really enjoy Marvel films, not all of them. I do, I do have standards, you guys but I enjoy quite a bit of them. But I am by all accounts a card carrying, Comic-Con attending <laughs> geek. Uh, it's even in my Instagram handle. If you don't know, I am a geek about fashion and a geek who loves fashion. So I'm a geek about designers and a geek that loves designers. <laughs> so hence the name there. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed the first Black Panther movie and I thoroughly enjoyed Wakanda Forever as well because it was amazing. And a big part of that was the costuming. Ruth E. Carter really did the most for this film. In addition to all of the extensive research that she had done for the first Black Panther movie, as far as studying different African nations and learning about their cultures and their costumes and pulling from those references to create the costumes for the for the first film she brought all of that with her for this film and then in addition to that this time around she was also doing heavy research on mesoamerican history and mayan culture to create the costumes for talocan according to the rap while Carter could lean on the lore Bible that she had developed with director Ryan Coogler and the rest of the film's crew to create the new outfits for the Wakandans, like the all-white attire worn at T'Challa's funeral, building the world of the film's antagonist, Namor, or Namor, required building an entirely new lore Bible built from hundreds of hours of research into Mayan history and the marine biology of the Yucatan Peninsula. A lore Bible. Hundreds of hours of research. Like, yes, she 1000% deserved the award. That, that little part alone, that little bit of info alone tells me everything I need to know and that she absolutely deserved this award. So Carter and the production design team, which were led by the Oscar winning Hannah Beekler, did things like use the real life Mayans use of Jade as the basis for Talokan's version of Vibranium. Uh, and so she says, we were able to use kelp and bones and pieces of jade to create the finer details of the Talokanese look. Just as the Mayans would use the natural items from their surroundings and their clothing, we imagined that Talokan would use the plants and shells and fish bones from the ocean floor throughout their culture. As if that wasn't enough, she also did a lot of things like experiment with different colors and textures and fabrics to create pieces that would still stand out when being filmed underwater. There were a lot of costumes that were designed without the knowledge of how exactly they were going to be seen on camera. We used molds of shark fins and rope and things like octopus legs that they could use like suction cups to hold on to the whales as they are riding them. Like so much thought, so much thought and work was put into the design of all of these costumes. Like get, give her several Oscars. Oh, I mean, she has two. I also really loved all of the contemporary clothing too. Like I loved Shuri's costumes, but I also just like loved Shuri's wardrobe, even in the first movie. Like they're just so, yep, that's just a cool chick. That's a cool chick in STEM. So there is this technical aspect in her sportswear as well. She's just cool. Also completely unrelated to <laughs> the costume design. I actually really loved the use of music in this film and in particular Shuri's 
theme. When Shuri assumes the role of Black Panther, the original Black Panther team takes on almost this like Tron-esque synth sound as if to highlight how different she is and how much more technology and like STEM is her forte because you went from mostly like heavy traditional sounding drums like African drums to more of this synth sound that was made using more modern technology. So I really loved how <laughs> the music also told that story to that, that set her apart in that specific way. I also just love Tron and that whole soundtrack. I thought it was fun like hearing that that sound out of like out of no Nowhere. So yet another great detail. Every aspect of Wakanda Forever felt really well thought out to me. And there's your proof. Overall highlights. Happy birthday sung by the entirety of Hollywood pretty much. I thought that was so sweet. I, I've never seen that before. I'm pretty sure they've never sung happy birthday in that theater. <laughs> so I thought that was really fun. Everything everywhere, cast and crew wearing googly, googly eyes. The guy who won best editor and James Hong just have, having googly eyes on them. I thought that was so cute. The hair. This was a night of fabulous hair. We saw so many natural hairstyles on the red carpet and so many like unbothered simple do's and you know a lot of uh, actresses were just like I'm gonna wear my hair down, I'm gonna wear my hair natural, I'm gonna do what I want. Uh, like Florence Pugh's funky hairstyle, Michelle Williams going full Mia Farrow, uh, Denai Guerrera, Janelle Monae. This I, I feel like this was the best hair night. Everything everywhere all at once absolutely sweeping. The awards winning seven out of eleven. I still feel like Stephanie Shu was was robbed of that one. Uh, but the same can also be said for Angela Bassett. <laughs> So if you are also on team Angela Bassett should have taken home the Oscar, then congrats. We agree that it should not have gone to Jamie Lee Curtis. I think too, what made Angela Bassett losing that award hurt that much more is that in case you don't know, if you are not an award show person back in 2021, <laughs> oh God. Normally they save the best picture category as the final category, but back in 2021, they actually switched it and made best actor the, the final category. So the Academy had like set it up to, to make it seem like Chadwick Boseman was going to take home the Academy Award for best actor for Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. So, and his widow was in attendance to possibly, to accept a possible award on his behalf. So they make this whole big deal about switching the categories around. And so everyone is expecting that Chadwick Boseman, who has now passed, is going to win um, his Oscar uh, posthumously. And that's gonna be like the grand finale of the award show. And then it ends up going to Anthony Hopkins instead, who wasn't even in attendance because they wouldn't allow him to attend the Oscars via like a Zoom call. So he wins, isn't there to accept his award. And so the award show just ends. So naturally everyone's like pissed because it was sort of set up to, to make make us all think that Chadwick Boseman was going to win an Oscar posthumously and that they were saving that for last as like grand finale tribute to the awards that didn't happen. And so I think we were kind of looking for Angela Bassett to win this for him. So it's unfortunate that that didn't happen. Um, that being said, all of the nominees in that category were amazing. Viola Davis and Women King were totally snubbed and uh, I really don't understand that decision either. But I thoroughly enjoyed uh, Rihanna's Lift Me Up performance. Uh, I thought her Chadwick Boseman tribute in that regard was just perfection. Again, redefining pregnant lady fashion. I predicted hers was going to be the best performance of the night and it pretty much was. I will say that I did thoroughly enjoy the Not Too Not Too performance from RRR. I thought that was actually incredible. Um, I thought that was so fun. Had no idea what they were saying, but it didn't matter. I'm I'm glad that that, that one best song, even though I don't understand it, um, that was another one where I thought Rihanna was gonna take home the Oscar. I went going, Rihanna's got this in the bag. <laughs> and that she didn't get it either. So that was another bummer. 
Uh, I caught Alex Wong uh, as one of the backup dancers on that Natu Natu performance. So it was really fun to to catch him there because I think he's fabulous. Follow him on Instagram or TikTok if you don't already because he's so fun. Um, and speaking of Angela Bassett, another notable highlight the Angela Bassett, Austin Butler hand-holding while waiting for the Best Actor announcement. Love to see it. Love that. Was so awesome. I had a whole thing about the musical performances, but I'm not even gonna bother. Um, but we can talk about them in the comments if you'd like. I will say though, applause was a snooze fest, and uh, this might be an unpopular opinion, uh, forgive me if this sounds unnecessarily harsh, but I feel that Diane Warren should retire from songwriting because she's lost her spark and hasn't had a hit in 20 years. But that's just me. Also, I never got into Pretty Little Liar, so I had to Google who Sophia Carson was. Also, Purple Hearts? Really? Come on. That chick? No. Um, but bravo for Lady Gaga taking all her makeup off <laughs> and performing in jeans and sneakers and a t-shirt. Uh... Kudos. Something about that Sunlock, Stephanie Hsu, David Byrne performance was off. Um, Stephanie Hsu is a Broadway baby, so for those of you who don't know, but Mitski did the song originally, so I don't know if Stephanie Hsu was filling in for her and if that was like a last minute decision. And David Byrne is just a legend. So, but, but something about this performance wasn't totally there. Uh, that was my only thing. I was expecting it to be a lot better than it was. But Rihanna, 10 out of 10. Would love to know your thoughts about the show. Let me know what you liked, what you loved, what you didn't like, what you hated. And again, if you haven't seen my Everything Everywhere video, go check that out. And thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one.